Good start. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, so we are being joined on Zoom this evening. I know Ross has a son joining us all the way from Berlin. Yes, brilliant. Um, now, I'm just going to introduce Ross and then he'll kick off. So Ross was raised in Rockhampton in a bygone era of innocence and in retrospect, stunning ignorance, experiencing an early life cocooned in Catholicity. He entered a seminary with faith and left with none. On to social work, development work in PNG, time as international chairperson of Amnesty International, just failed federal electoral candidate for the ALP and lecturer for 25 years at QUT. Addicted to travel with his wife, Sharon, Ross has a life enriched by four children, their partners, and four starlight grandchildren whose living just moment to moment surpasses that of the Dalai Lama. Ross has recently discovered his own Aboriginal heritage and is now a confirmed, active, inquisitive member of the Iman Nation in search of his personal and cultural history. He is the author of his first novel, The Journey. So let's welcome Ross. Hi, guys. Hi, guys. Uh, look, I, I'm just uh, really thrilled that uh, people have come out for this. And uh, uh, so just thanks very much. And uh, I know there's a, a, a few people on Zoom from uh, Rockhampton and uh, my uh, son and his girlfriend, Sinead, are over in Berlin. So you could say this is an international event now. <laughs> uh, and uh, my other son who uh, caught COVID with his um, girlfriend, Jackie. So they're also watching. Folk, did I say Rockhampton? And uh, a couple of people in Sydney as well. So just like to thank um, everybody. And it's a bit overwhelming, I have to say. Um, just before we start, just to clarify a couple of things. Uh, I've been asked by a couple of people who've read this book, uh, is it autobiographical or is it something else? And so um, just to clarify as we go along, there will be some questions. Now, if you really like the book and are complimentary, then it's autobiography. And if you don't, then it's the narrator in the book. So we can <laughs> clarify that at the beginning. Um, so I'm going to talk for about 30 minutes or thereabouts. I wrote it all down. I'll probably, you know, not go there very much. But uh, I certainly need to start with uh, acknowledgements of, uh, without these people, you know, this wouldn't be happening. And uh, my Kelly and Lexi, Sam and Joe, I've already mentioned. Josh, who's Kelly's partner and just a great mate because of what he's uh, done with putting up uh, ads on the um, billboards around West End. And uh, thanks to him and thanks also to uh, Goa. Uh, Chris over there, who's just a, been a great friend. And also to Sinead and to um, Jackie. Sam and Joe, I have already uh, uh, mentioned. So uh, I think if I miss anything, Sharon, you just let me know. So uh, these folk, uh, these folk have just been uh, so incredibly important to me. Uh, and then there are these four little ones that I call them down here who. Uh, if you want a life enriched, then get four of these, I recommend. Uh, and everywhere Sharon and I have been uh, on our travel journeys, uh, these have been very much in our mind. Uh, Lily has the enormous task of finding a lock that I put on a bridge in Venice, but there are very clear instructions on how she should do that. Uh, all of them have little temples and all sorts of things in the Andes Mountains and in the Stans countries. So as we've travelled along, they have been very much part of it. And um, they just delight me and everybody in our family all the time. Recently, they're, they're just magic with uh, current technologies and all that. And uh, recently we were out of the park and we met somebody and immediately... Uh, <laughs> Ruby said, you know, he's a famous author. And <laughs> <laughs> someone else said, and he's got a YouTube channel. And Ned said, make sure you subscribe. So, you know, this is, a, this is the world that we are, uh, we're currently uh, living in. It's so different to, uh, like, looking at the age range here. You, you will all remember when you went overseas or somebody went overseas in the 60s or the 70s and you waited for six weeks and the postcard came with a picture of Trafalgar Square and it said, got here, all well, hope you are well. 
Well, that's not the world today, is it? The world today is instant uh, touch note Zoom. And in the book itself, um, these little four, four little ones come up quite regularly in the encounters that we have. So uh, I just wanted to make sure that everybody was aware that these folk have been so central to me. And this course, one person not mentioned, um, and that's Sharon, and nothing, nothing could have happened without her. She's been more than a, uh, a travel companion. She's been really a life partner, and it's been um, just an unbelievable, not just a physical journey of travel, but a journey of exploration and understanding and talking. All of that stuff has been, uh, you know, with, with her, over these many years. I think we've been to something like 50 countries uh, together. And I, the theme of my novel is the quirkiness of the human species, the strangeness of the human species. And we have some strange habits together. And my family would say to me, I think that they have no idea how she has put up with me. It's a very, it's a very biased view from members of the family, but anyway, uh, and when we travel together, uh, I'm quite meticulous in the planning. And so every breakfast, we would have a discussion about what we'll do during the day. And Sharon's uh, traditional response is, that sounds good. So I've done all the work and that's, that's what, I, what I get. So the only reason that I'm here tonight, that the novel that's been written, is because Sharon is a prolific reader. And beside our bed at home at any one time, as anybody who's been to our house would testify, there would be 15 to 20 books. Uh, whenever we go out, we have to go to the Ashgrove Library. The car actually knows how to get to the Ashgrove Library. Like Elon Musk might be inventing, you know, cars for super navigation, but ours actually knows its way to the Ashgrove Library, where to park and where to get the book. And the reason that is important is because she's a very discerning, critical reader. And so I gave her the first two chapters and there was a thumbs up. She said, yep, it's okay. And from that point on, I thought I was probably on a winner. Not necessarily a wildly popular book, but on a winner in terms of uh, an endeavour to do something that is humorous, quirky, but actually, I think, uh, an incredibly serious book. It's probably my best throw of the dice on what I think about the human species and uh, where we are. It's somewhat paradoxical, and I'm going to begin with something that's, the first part of this is actually quite, uh, not the best way to sell a book, I would think. Um, but it, it's somewhat paradoxical that I was writing this at a time when uh, I and my family were discovering something about our own Aboriginal heritage. It had been rumoured and murmured in the family for years and years. And through a circumstance and happenstance and all of those other stances, uh, we were able to discover that uh, I'm an Imam person. We went to Rockhampton, we met the elders. Uh, the generosity of the elders was extraordinary. And then we were incredibly lucky because a number of people in this room, we all went on this journey with the Star of Tarim, a very special stone for the Iman people that was in the backyard of somebody at the Gap. And we walked it some 500 kilometers back to Tarim. And it was, it, it was just a wonderful experience really um, to do that. And since that time, uh, I, Kelly, Lexi, Sam, Cho have all been accepted into and are now part of the Iman nation. Hence the shirt, hence the logo on the shirt. And I think uh, we are extraordinarily privileged to now be able to make a claim that we have a linkage and a connection to the oldest culture on this planet. And that's the first thing that I wanted to allude to about the human species has all sorts of good things. The more I go on, it is 
the cruelty of us that has made me really pause. And that cruelty has been brought into sharp focus by the contradiction between what happened to the Iman people and the extraordinary generosity and welcome to the people who came later. That's not a story confined to Australia. And in the journey, I've alluded a number of times to the dispossession and the degradation and the distreatment and all of the other things. And I just want to read this to you. The, this is in the context of a meeting with a human rights activist and trying to understand the background to a horrible civil war. Go, Mike. He was certain that the start of this was a time when the superior skinned ones with crosses of, no, of a nailed man. By the way, there are no names in the book. The only person named in the book actually doesn't exist. So that's a little conundrum for you to work out. And the reason why I did that is because I didn't want to make it person specific. Actually, in Papua New Guinea, they have this lovely tradition um, that when a child is born, it's not named for a year or so. And when Sharon and I lived in Papua New Guinea, we felt for it every time. Uh, there would be a little kid running around. We'd say, what's her name? No name. And I just, it was just lovely, you know, no name. And not until the child, um, you know, produces a personality does the name come. He was certain that the start of this was the time when the superior skinned ones with crosses of a nailed man decided that whatever had happened before their arrival fell somewhere between the subhuman, the primitive, the inferior. The superior skinned one with crosses of a nailed man had done this countless times across lands and peoples. Their salvation crosses of a nailed man planted with breathtaking arrogance, promises of redemption reinforced with the in instruments of unimaginable cruelty. They had come uninvited to wherever they wished taking whatever they wanted. Great tomes had been written about the superior skinned one with crosses. He, that's the narrator, had read some of these and become familiar, more familiar with the age. They violated, subjugated, had no doubt as to the violence of the superior skinned one with crosses. Centuries later, it was increasingly thought that their violence had stopped, certainly had been subdued by resistance of the forces of those oppressed. But the superior skinned ones with crosses had succeeded with the violence that it endured, passed down relentlessly, methodically from one generation to the next, cemented in narrative after narrative, insidious, twisting time, history, and even space. It was the language of their violence that continued to survive. Their self proclaimed daring and ingenuity still told as discovered, found, and explored. Their self-professed superior, self superior knowledge still told as educated, trained, and developed. Their special beings and their special truths told as salvation, civilization, and conversion. I think that has a generic application right across the board. And I wanted to start with that, which is not exactly uplifting, because it really is a tribute to Iman people, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, all the Indigenous people around the world who have been subject to centuries, absolute centuries of violence, and yet their resilience has meant that the Iman nation has gone from being regarded as extinct to being now the biggest Aboriginal corporation in Australia, in, in Queensland. So uh, I, I just think that uh, we make an acknowledgement to country and that's good and proper, but I think there are times when we need to go far deeper to make an acknowledgement that, when I say we now, it's a bit ambiguous, but you know, we collectively have missed out on 80,000 years of culture. And Sharon and I were talking the other day about Aboriginal astronomy, and it's just extraordinary. The first astronomers, and yet, somehow or other, the brutality that we've inflicted, we 
we are the losers at this. That sounds a bit crass to say that because of the suffering of people. But then, so, so that's a theme that runs through the book. It's a theme about institutions and the continuance of dishonesty and the way history is written and twisted. And you hear it every night on the news now, which is a, a society which has lost the truth, where activists and people who really are struggling for justice are converted into the terrorist. They're converted into the dissident. And we have this incredibly banal statement about it's time for people to move on. Um, and that's a theme that is in, that again penetrates the book. Um, there are a number of people here from when I was at the seminary and uh, it, I think we'd all agree it was something of a strange, there's no logic to this by the way. Um, there's, <laughs> there's something in that, that I went to the, se the seminary because I just couldn't get my head around the question of human suffering. I'm not alone in it, so I think there's a lot of people in the room who think that's probably correct. Um, but uh, I can somewhat understand suffering by happenstance. You know, uh, tsunamis come, tectonic plates move. Actually, the only research I did on this book was the tectonic plates of all things. Um, but you know, there was a massive um, catastrophic tsunami that wiped out, particularly Sri Lanka, was hit, Southeast Asia was, lit, was hit. And, you know, there are all sorts of stories about, you know, if only people had not left early, not left late, you know, the traffic light had come, okay, right, and we know that, you know, genetics caused this and the other, happenstance, right? I guess being on the planet, can't do much about that, that comes along. But the suffering that really gets me is the suffering caused by the arrogant by those who are in power, those who just lie and lie and lie. And I've actually seen this, that don't want to overstate, but I've seen this type of suffering through my work with Amnesty and particularly colleagues with, with, with Amnesty. And I've seen fields where the dead are buried, hundreds of bodies are buried. I've seen, you, you know, we see on the news, the extraordinary suffering that occurs when a child goes missing, right? It just rips your heart out. But there is a, a part in the book which deals quite a lot with a, based on a person that I know who was a human rights activist and she lost her family in a terrible civil war. I'm, I met with a couple of other people with officials and the, these officials, you know, you see them every night on the news, they're linguistically perfect. They're cultivated hands, their nails are good, they're dressed impeccably. And they say everything, they've been to the right universities. And yet confronted with grotesque suffering, they sit there and they won't tell people where the bodies are. And I've got this from the book. So the niece is in this, and all she wants, she knows her family is dead, but there would be relief just knowing that. None of this was available to, need, to the niece. Release from part of her suffering was blocked by the official. She could not move while locked in the rippling of her suffering. Here was evil, so simple. The official someone, anyone, a proxy could just tell her. And that part of her suffering would change from endless searching to a finding, a burying, a mourning, a knowing, a visiting, incense, fruit, flowers, placed. She would know. That would comfort. That part of her endlessness would stop. It was this unnecessary part that was foul. That part of her endlessness would stop. It was that part that made him seethe with loathing and anger. It applied to those in this his place, to the niece and to all those whose endless suffering was caused by the officials, the arrogant, arrogant ones with power. And having brutalized the niece and condemned her to an endless suffering, the official and the arrogant ones like him 
went home to play and eat with their children. And so on some nights, they might like lie naked with partners who also knew, naked in twined filth. There is an arrogance about power, and truly, you only have to watch the news to get it. I'll just go off track here a bit because I'm no, no, it's okay. Um, so, so that that is the theme that just continues on, and you know we we see that every day um, on our news and so on and so forth. So, so basically, you say like it is a bit of a strange species that we tolerate this, that we allow that to go on, that we've never, we're not, we're not learning anything from this, and uh, you know, you can't get away from trying to understand why that suffering persists and why we can't do it and why people dress up, and we'll come to in a few minutes' time uh, the complete loss of truth in our society. The the habit of continual lying. But not all travel is, you know, just about those sorts of things. But I think I've developed, without being too eager, I think I've, I've developed a bit of a quirkiness. Um, I know when I was thinking about this novel, Sharon and I were traveling a couple of countries and I would stop and go away with my iPhone and make a few recordings. And, and it just helps you to continue to observe. I love the ordinariness of travel. You know, just sitting in a coffee shop, just watching ordinary people go about their ordinary lives. You know, we are a pretentious mob. We are extraordinarily pretentious. You know, we have houses with three bathrooms and two toilets, and unless there's some sort of dysentery outbreak, you wonder, well, why, why would you want to do that? And um, when I travel, and when I, we were on trains and that, and you would travel through slums, and out of those slums would come immaculately dressed kids. And there's some real dignity in that. I'm not trying to be patronising or anything like that, but I just think, you know, comparatively, when you hear somebody say, and I say it all the time, the day can't get any worse, believe me, it can. And so in, in travelling, it is that ordinariness that I probably like more now than going to those places which I am increasingly disliking. You can see that I'm uh, like a pent up little angry person, but I'm increasingly disliking this idea of going to the temples, going to the palaces, going to the great monuments, because as I've said here, that's, a, that's the attractions that go to. But when you think about that, when you think about what you're looking at, I just find it now really quite weird that we tolerate this. And here is just a little extract again. That for all the differences in the ruins, conceived, built in different times, places, people, and cultures, a similarity of sameness cuts across a commonality across all. It annoyed him. All the, rule, all the ruins were built by the ruler or the ruler's families. All the rulers were great. All were wise. And as the stories told were true, they were blessed with multitudes of skilled and consummate knowledge about all things to do with building. What might take a team of multidisciplinary experts could be achieved by one man, very rarely a woman. The ruler, the king, the prince, the emperor, the khan, whatever the term applied at the time in that place, he knew, of course, that nothing could be further from the truth. The king, the queen, the ruler, the whatever, may have had an initial idea in approving and an ongoing monitoring that much he conceded. But outside that, there was no contribution to the actual construction. But all the others, all the complexities, the myriad of things that must have been done to achieve something majestic, something startling, something functional yet splendid, that was the work of the brilliant, the clever, the skilled, always supported by thousands of those coerced, never mentioned, always forgotten. The credit went to the ruling one who in truth was really a charlatan, a fraud, a swindler, claiming credit for the work of others done. And 
I developed this little habit of always putting my hand on a brick and just stopping for the moment and thinking, who put the brick there? And what were their lives like? Because it ain't going to be like the ruler sitting in some bloody palace, looking down, being fanned, swanning around, and all the rulers. So, again, you know, it is these questions of the species, the power, the way in which, like my son was in Paris recently, and he said the Palace of Versailles was one of the most obscene things he'd ever seen. And then, you know, we talk about the Queen, good on her. But, you know, honestly, it's the British Museum is just a place of stolen property. And yet it goes on. The last couple of things is the themes that through here is that I think it's pretty noticeable that we now live in a society where our connection to the truth is just not even a consideration. Uh, lying is the is the um, oh, well, it's just the, the habit, isn't it? Let me just warn you, and Russell, my friend from Rocky, and others in my family will know. Don't come to our house when the news is on. <laughs> I just don't come. Um, we watch SBS and we watch ABC. That can take us through to eight o'clock because it's um, it's just constant commentary. Fortunately, we can pause now and when we chat to each other about what's going on. There is a genetic connection because my father had the same habit. Uh, and in those days, you couldn't pause. But he, the minute the news start, he would argue with the person on the news. And my mother, a woman of great tolerance and patience, lost it one day and said, Ivan, we just want to listen to the bloody news. And uh, that's the same. But, but you know, I don't know why we put up with this. If you look at the nightly news, I just wonder what it is we're allowing ourselves to do. And one of the most terrifying things that you can ever hear is when a commercial channel says most voters decide on who to vote for from listening to our news service. I mean, that's enough to send you into a mogadon. Uh, you know, it's, you know, <laughs> intravenous valium would need to come along. But there's something interesting about that because if you look at the sort of news thing, and I'm saying this because it's a common pattern of manipulation, a common pattern of uh, of that. Uh, we have a set piece for news. It always starts with something that's uh, spectacular. If there are pigeons pooing on the Red Cliff Bridge, that the eye in the sky will capture that. And then it will move to a neighbour who has absolutely nothing to contribute. Not a sausage to contribute to the intellectual stimulation of the youth. True? No, no, no. They just happen to be there and they're asked to everything. Nothing. Not a sausage. There will be a murderer or somebody, a crime committed. But as the new, and we're all horrified, and there are, they are all horrified, and there will be a story about a murderer. And if it's a grotesque murderer, there will be a warning, right? This may disturb some viewers. Infinite number of telephone numbers will be uh, put up to help. What's amazing about that is that the next news item could be Vladimir Putin like a mass killer. Shouldn't there be warning signs? Putin is about to appear. Get your children out of the brain, right? Here comes a mass murderer. And then we have it in our own election, which is lie after lie after lie after lie. And so I don't, this is common across huge numbers of places now where this distortion of truth uh, is an odd thing about our species. Throughout this, these things come and go, flow, wax and flow. It's not all heavy, it's not all, but it comes and goes. And the thing that binds the journey 
because it comes up in a number of ways. It's about culture, it's about tradition, it's about the customs. I can't stand it, for example, when Sharon had to move because she was sitting next to a monk and apparently that was uh, just a terrifying experience for the monk. Uh, I can't stand, well, it did happen, it happens all the time, you know, well, honest to God. And I can't stand seeing women and young girls in cladding on the beach when their husbands and fathers are not to feel the touch of skin on sea because somebody somewhere came up with just the weirdest idea. And I've said over and over again, these ideas are long past their use by date. And so there are endless examples of all of that. Uh, I wonder whether or not we are actually a bit of a spoilt species having such an arrogance about ourselves. And one of those arrogances is that we're going to live forever. We're going to go on and on and on forever. And the evidence for that is really not that powerful. But when I was little, I had a great aunt. It was this, it's not so funny story, really. But anyway, my mother and I were up at the hospital and the great aunt was dying. I had no idea who the great aunt was, and I didn't have any idea what was about to happen. But anyway, mum had to go and get a toilet, and she decided to get a cup of tea. In the meantime, the great aunt died. And uh, it took me quite a bit of time to figure out what had happened. But anyway, um, the next, a couple of days later, uh, somebody came and said, um, the great aunt hadn't died. They've just gone to a better place. And so this grasping species, always wanting more, always elevating itself to some higher plane, always demanding comfort, never accepting extinction. This superiority claiming species appear, appeared perfectly at ease, accepting the most ludicrous of claims. The spoilt baby demanding comfort. Identical because while the time and ages and times might differ, formulations might vary, ceremonies might diverge, bodies could be buried, devoured by carrions, women could be tossed on pyres. It was always the same. Not dead, well, dead, but not gone. Well, deceased but living, separated but reunited not here, but elsewhere, departing and arriving, old form, but new form, leaving daughter and finding mother, departing friend, renewing friend, all explained as a mystery, the stuff of the human, buried in the marrow of the human. Something like that, right? Just what would happen if we just decided, this is not the book, but it's a, it's a question, what would happen if we just decided we are all gonna die, this is it, Let's really make the most of it because we've got one shot in the locker. Um, so they're the sort of heavy metal things that are in the book, but I think the uh, best shot that I can make of trying to work out and wonderment at this human species, which at one stage thought we were the center of the universe and we now know we're not. Um, and we need to make some sense out of this. And, I guess the proposition in the book is that um, this is a weirdness about the human species. We're not able to let go of ideas, traditions, and cultures that have long lost their use by date. In travel, and just ending a couple of seconds, having said that uh, humans are weird, odd, I have to confess that, you know, I'm not exactly saintly in this area myself, you know. Um, I do have some idiosyncrasies. I love my Apple Watch. I get frantically annoyed at technology that doesn't work. Yeah, <laughs> I know, I, they, might, they might not know that. Um, 
Sam, if you're there, <laughs> I've made repeated attempts at meditation, just the most useless thing you could ever do. <laughs> but I remember sitting in a room and Sam came in and he said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm bloody meditating, get out. <laughs> then, you know, then quite go with the spirit of the spirit of the time. And in the book, it is true that Sharon and I have this, developed this habit of putting our feet together in the sea or the ocean or a river. My children immediately leapt to foot fetish. There's a big leap between an enjoyable habit of touching feet in the Pacific Ocean and foot fetish, but that's where they went to. <laughs> um, and things that I do that are just you know, odd. Like I can, Sharon can drive to the shop every day and not at any time be threatened with death. I can drive to the shop and there'll be road rage and I'll come up with stories of how lucky I was survived. So I'm not pretending to be innocent in this. But in the, in the travel, I, I really do like to find humorous things. If anybody has traveled, particularly in some particular countries where if you are first in line, that's no guarantee of being served, right? It's just a hush and a huddle <coughs> to get there. And at first I accepted, then I got annoyed, then I got angry, and then I developed the technique. A decade later, his skill had been practiced and refined with no emotional constriction, no hesitation, no sensitivity. Now he was vigilant, now always on the lookout for the potential intruder. He had developed identification intelligence, detection sensitivity not yet seen in advanced surveillance drones. He anticipated if the intruder attack came from the left, whether arm, shoulder or body, was met with a left foot swivel. So if you're at the top of the counter and you see somebody coming to bug in, that's the position. <laughs> and if it's the other way, that's the position. And the key is to break the umbilical link between the person at the counter and the eyes of the intruder. I've developed that. I'm happy to pass that down on to you about <laughs> how to get served. So um, I have to say, though, for all the... Uh, rudeness, the extraordinary ability of people to help is just wonderful. There have been times when we've been travelling that we've wanted to book something and Sharon and I have found ourselves completely irrelevant because particularly in China, people will gather and there will be this flurry of conversation. We will be at the back hoping that somebody figures out where we're going. And so in contrast, in contradiction to the, you know, to the hassle and the home, there are really great uh, uh, things. One of the best, and I love scams. I really like scams. I'm brilliant at one of them. That's the duty-free shop. Have you been to the duty-free shop? Oh, I just love it. Because I can't ever afford, uh, I think I used to call it just underarm deodorant, but apparently it's toiletries or what do they call it now? Odie clothes, I don't know. But anyway, uh, I can get, I, I come out of there just smelling like you never believed it, you know. Um, and they know I'm scamming because they know I'm not going to buy anything. And so you look for the bottle with the tester on and when they come up to say, can I help? Just looking is the answer. But the, the scams on the other side are really great. There are two, I want to, a couple I want to tell you about. Uh, again, because... You know, I go there, Sharon and I go there, and, you know, what's $10 to us and what's $20 to us, really? But $10, $20, that's what the, that's what the porter at the railway station makes or the person walking along the beach selling uh, all the florals and, and, and the uh, tablecloths and all of those sorts of things. I can remember really uh, a wonderful thing I went, never ever go into a shop making clothes. That's the, that's the lesson to be learned from there. I went in and I expressed some interest in a suit. The man measured me up as I walked seriously, two blocks. He measured every part of my body and was ready to get me to sign. Um, there's another person I was walking along and it's a brilliant scam. 
this person came up and said, how are you? Nice to see you again. And I've got no idea. But, you know, you just, there's a seed of doubt. Do I know you? Do I not know you? Yeah, I'm from your hotel, remember? And look, luckily enough, my father's got a shop just down the road here and a special deal for you, just for you today. And I always think that's incredibly lucky. How did I know I was going to be there? How did they construct the deal? No. So, you know, if you get over getting annoyed at scams, you can actually uh, enjoy them. And one of the best was, and it's in the book, uh, walking along the beach and there was this man, most of the fishing boats had gone out and a couple of dilapidated boats there. And there was a boat there that just compelled you to go. It had an elephant sail. In fact, it's on the front cover of the book. Well, yeah, that's probably infringed copyright there, but it was just a brilliant. Um, so I went along and I had a, a, a you know a chat, if you can, without anybody knowing what the language was. And what he was offering me, I wasn't sure of. Um, <laughs> But he was offering me something like, a, it wasn't a, a sale, it was a sea safari. So he was offering me a sea safari in a boat which was very suspicious, uh, powered by an elephant sail. But it was such a lovely thing that uh, I'm so pleased to see it on the cover of the book because that's how the man earned his living. And I just thought that's so... That's so good. Now I could go on and on and on, but um, there are quirkiness, I think, humorous things in this book. Um, I can in, I can just in the last couple of minutes in, invite you to think what you might do and what you might expect if you pass the Church of the Sacred Hand. Would you go in and what would you find inside? And we went in and we did find. And the Temple of the Holy Tooth. We didn't find the Holy Tooth, but we were assured it was there. Uh, for some reason or other, in writing the book, I got quite taken up with the concept of guardian angels. Folk from the seminary will know about this, but if you were in a business and somebody came in with a model of a guardian angel with wings coming from its shoulders, you would say, not much of a business case, really. Wouldn't you? You'd say, this is not going to go. But somebody came up with that idea hundreds and hundreds of years ago, and it went on and on and on. So much so that every Catholic would know everybody had a guardian angel. I have to tell you, for adolescent boys and girls, having a guardian angel was a real constriction on certain honest, healthy activities. <laughs> So, look, I, I think that's about all I really want to say. You know, it's, as I said, there's, there's no logic to what I've said. Um, I'm, just, I'm just left with a bemusement about my own species, about why we hold on to ideas and traditions and customs that in the final event just really constrict, why we tolerate lying, why we can sit not just uh, here, but elsewhere. And we have to put up with deluge of lies and distrust and misinformation. And every night we get shocked by somebody who may have killed somebody in a suburb and we blithely let somebody who is a murderer sit in front of us. So all of that somehow or other uh, it was a good way to spend COVID. Uh, started in, finished it in six months, first book. And I really enjoyed the book. I have to say, after that, finding a publisher, marketing, and all of that, I would recommend it to no one. It's just a really puzzling, amusing feel. But anyway, that's where we are, and that's how we all got to. And I'm really thrilled to see everybody here. I just, I just love to hear people's opinions. Um, I don't expect everybody to like it at all. I think there are quirkiness in the way it's written. I think having nobody named, a deliberate choice, made the writing fractionally more difficult, makes the reader probably takes a bit more time to get used to the, the pace of the book and the thing. And I've left out whole chunks in here 
about things that we've observed. And a couple of folk have found dumps, a couple of chapters, very uh, resonant to their own experiences. So that's where we are. And again, thanks everybody for coming. And I hope I've given you a bit of a taste of what's in it. Up to question time. If anyone's got some questions, fire away. I'm just going to repeat it for Zoom if yeah. that's okay. So it's just about um, did you enjoy writing the book? I loved it. I well, I really, really loved going to all the places, and you know, because you've been to so many places, and Matilda, you've been, and Ned and Ruby. We're off to Rocky, aren't we? On um, Sharon, and I, Ruby, and Lily. We're all off to Rocky for an inline reunion on the weekend. So uh, that will be really, really lovely. But Kelly, Lily, yes, I did. I loved making writing the book. Uh, I loved giving the chapters to Sharon to read, and I loved reliving all the things that we had. Lots of the things that we'd seen on the journeys, the the real journeys that we'd made. So there are real journeys and there are the things that I've just talked about as well. But the answer is, I love writing. Anybody else? What was your question? Did you go for a sale? Uh, no. Uh, see, there's something about self-preservation. <laughs> and, and I haven't got it here, but there was, there was an incredible mismatch between us because I finally concluded he was offering me a ride in a very choppy sea on a very fragile boat to an unknown destination <laughs> for about 200 US dollars. <laughs> and I just thought either our communications have been really wrong or there's a mismatch in expectations here. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? You said you don't regret writing the yeah, because, I, you know, I could see these, these things are generic. They're an amalgam of places. You, you know, it, if you're, you know, there's a terrible situation on in Sri Lanka at the moment. And Sri Lanka is a place where there's, there's a couple of ruling families there, who, in my opinion, are just bloody evil, right? But that's the case. You, you couldn't sing, single them out. They, they might dress differently. They might have different language. They might have nuance of different culture. But honestly, the sameness of what goes on is pretty universal. Uh, and we, I suppose in Australia, we like to think ourselves different, but I don't, you know, wow, you know, wow. Well, well, I don't think so. So, no, I don't name the places. It's pretty easy to pick up some of them, though, because genuine masala tea. Everybody know masala tea? Solitary is just this most, if there is God, that's a gift. <laughs> and it's made of hot boiling milk and lots of tea and ginger and spice and cinnamon. I've tried to replicate it here in Australia and I finally figured out why I can't do that. I have no idea why I'm telling you this. Um, <laughs> but the answer to how you can identify it is that you can only get masala tea if you find it on a road where all the local people are going to and they all have little paper cups and they all miss the rubbish bin and you all you know <coughs> that this is a genuine pot so it's not the ingredients it's the pot which hasn't been cleaned for about 150 years <laughs> and it has a layer there that the taste oozes into and the other way you can pick it is masala dosa have you ever had masala dosa well, don't die without having one. Uh, it's a flat red with just so they are two giveaways on um, identifying South Asia countries. Yeah. What is really? What is like? Um. Well, I always wanted to write a book, and for some reason, it was always going to be called the journey. And I think I'm. You wouldn't believe this, but I'm getting a bit old. Um, and I just wanted to write it so I could put down some thoughts about all of us, 
And so that's what inspired me to write it. And I hope that people would find it a bit funny, humorous, but also really quite serious. But also you guys, you four there, you inspired me a bit, a big bit. Anyone else? I've got a question. Yeah. Are you going to write anything else? I am. Um, and I've started, uh, and it is going to be about my Aboriginal heritage. And I can't give too much away. I mean, God, you know, well, Paramount, well, Paramount you? Netflix are there right on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, basically, it, I think this is a very common story, right? So a lot of people are discovering their connection to Aboriginal history and Aboriginal people. You know, you can't believe how thrilled I am about that. You know, I just think, wow, that's just something astounding to happen. And so the Imam people lived in Tarim and there were just awful things. But at the same time, my mob from England came out and they settled in Southeast Queensland and they travelled across Imam country. I'm going to weave a tile around that uh, because I think, I don't think many people in our family, I'm not accusing anybody, but I don't think many people in our family have twigged to the commonality between uh, Mary Ann and Nellie and Maggie Dunn and all of those who lived out in Tarum and thereabouts, and the fact that they were there. I'm a product of Mary Ann and Nellie, but at the same time, my other mob from England came across that land. And the paradox being that one mob left impoverishment and came to relative wealth. The other mob had relative wealth and they went to impoverishment. Mm -hmm. There's got to be a tale there somewhere. All righty. Well, thank you so much, Ross. You're a very thoughtful speaker. Let's do a round of applause. Um, so I just need to do a little book signing inside. So there's plenty of copies for sale. Helen's at the counter and um, we'll get you seated and signing. Oh, thanks. Oh, good. Thanks, hey, guys. Guys. I'm just really touched that you all took the time to come out. It's uh, really been a, a great night. A great night for me, for my family. And so thank you very much. It's deeply appreciated.